reform, I'm going to tell conservationists what they should be doing. But before that, who am I? My name is Stephen Corry, C O W R Y, I've got a board, I've got a Twitter account, and I've uh, for the last 47 years been working with an organization called Survival International, which is the movement for tribal people's rights. Thank you very much, Maya Rose, for inviting me here. Maya Rose talked without notes. I'm going to have a go. If I start rambling and if I go over my five minutes, can somebody please tell me? Because I've been given five minutes to talk about the history of conservation, which is quite a big topic. Uh, so where do I start? Well, let's just jump to right to the present and say there's a battle within conservation. Conservation is not for everybody. Conservation is viewed in many parts of the world as actually the old colonial structure coming in, stealing our land and kicking us out. Yeah? So the idea that you know it has to be inclusive, let's see what actually goes on. Let's see where it really starts. One place you can start or you manage about 1860s where the national park model was invented in the States. And we've heard a lot about Yosemite and I'm going to talk a bit also about Yosemite. The 1860s was the time of the Indian Wars. Yeah, the Native Americans were being kicked off their land and put into reservations, usually by military force and massacre uh, when they didn't comply. This is when Yellowstone and Yosemite started. All the American national parks were inhabited by Native Americans. It was their land. The people who promoted the initial idea were largely trophy hunters. They did not want subsistence hunters, people hunting for their food, hunting the herds. They wanted to keep the herds for themselves. Yeah? So the idea was that these trophy hunters wanted to get rid of the local people. They weren't all just Native Americans, but they mainly were. So those trophy hunters turned into the first conservationists. You look at the history of all the early conservation organizations, you will find major trophy hunters like uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Madison Grant. Uh, Madison Grant's a very big hidden figure in American conservation. He's at the beginning of many of the early conservation organizations. He wrote a book called The Passing of the Great Race. The Great Race was the white race. Uh, it was passing, but it was being attacked by immigrants from Southern Europe, from Eastern Europe, Jewish people. And the passing of the great race, he sent a copy to Adolf Hitler in the 1920s. Hitler called it his Bible. It was cited during the Nuremberg war trials. The Germans said, hang on a minute, we were just applying what the Americans came up with in the 1920s. Eugenic laws were widespread in the States. Uh, forcible, um, contraception, forcible abortions, forcible sterilization, all kinds of things were going on to try to keep the population of immigrants down, down to favor northern Europeans, not just all Europeans, northern Europeans, not southern Italians, Greeks, uh, Jews, northern Europeans. Uh, we can see clear clues of that going on today. So that's how the national park model started. Get rid of the locals, because they don't know how to look after the land, and we white guys will come in and uh, look after the land, initially for trophy hunting. And then there was a movement uh, gradually against trophy hunting. If you look at trophy hunting today, and they are still calling themselves conservationists. Yes. Uh, so, uh, that was the 1860s. Exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing, is going on today uh, in Africa. There, I don't think there's a single African protected area which has not excluded, often destroyed, uh, the local people. It's going on today in the Congo Basin where the uh, WWF has a project to create a new park in Congo called Mesop Jar. Uh, they are beating up the local Baka people, so-called pygmy people. Uh, they are uh, getting them out of the land. Uh, they are, uh, the rangers are then, uh, if they try and go back in to do any kind of subsistence activities, they are beaten, tortured, sometimes killed. This is today. Um, the National Park is not yet 
been created. This is the history of all African national parks. The big uh, East African Park, Salvo, very famous, uh, very big area in Kenya, was home to traditional elephant hunters. Uh, they were kicked out by the Brits in the 1920s. At one stage, they reckoned that <coughs> over half of them, half the entire population was uh, imprisoned. Of course, you get rid of the elephant hunters, which had maintained a natural predation on the elephant herds for uh, hundreds, if not thousands of years. What happens, the herds grow, uh, they get beyond the carrying capacity of the land, drought comes, you get very widespread uh, elephant starvation uh, and elephant deaths, and that's exactly what happened in Salva. So the, the, balance, the natural balance that the local people had with their environment is destroyed by removing them. It's destroyed. Now, a lot of these areas, which we think of as wilderness, right, uh, are actually human creations. A lot of this research is relatively new. Uh, the areas like Amazonia, for instance. Well, surely Amazonia has that got to be that's got to be pristine rainforest. The current thinking is that all of it, every single part of it, has some time or other been cut down by human habitation over the last five or 10,000 years. That the, the ecology is a creation of human occupation and human intervention. This is not entirely natural. It has been changed by human habitation. The East African grass plains are a product of the uh, herders which have been roaming across it with uh, very large herds, camel, cattle, and so forth, for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And nobody actually knows how long. Australia, if you look at when the Brits first went to Australia, the very first Brits said, this is fantastic. This looks like an English park. Yeah, this is a park land. They're great uh, open grass fields. You look at what the colonists were saying a couple of generations later, or even one generation later, and it, it was no longer a, a park. Why wasn't it? A, why didn't it look like a park? Because the Aboriginals actually held. Uh, they were growing grain. They had fish farms. They had uh, uh, villages made of stone, and so on and so forth. It was not a, t a territory in which the human habitation was simply people walking across it and occasionally hunting, hunting a kangaroo. This had been changed over tens of thousands of years of human habitation. That fact, increasingly recognized in scientific papers, it hasn't reached the general public. Uh, the fact that conservation in places like Africa is viewed with enormous hostility by the local people, that is not known to the general public here. It's well known if you go there. And it's the same in parts of Asia too. So, why don't they kick out the people from English national parks? Because they can't. If you look at where uh, conservationists have excluded local people, it is where they can, where the local people are uh, numerically small, politically weak, where they can't uh, basically put up sufficient resistance. The uh, at Mount Everest National Park, which I visited before, was made a national park, uh, the end of the 60s, uh, is full of the Sherpa, the famous Sherpas, and some other people. Why were, the, why were they allowed to stay? Because you can't kick the Sherpas out. These are the people who provide the Gurkhas for the British Army. You try and kick them out and see what happens. But the back of pygmies in Congo, you can kick them out, and that's exactly what happens. So, what do conservationists actually have to do? Bear in mind that what I said, the local people have actually created this environment in the first place. They are the people who have managed it. They know how to manage it. They know far more than the white conservationists coming in. And they know they know. Not only do they know that, they know when other people are coming in. They know when po genuine poachers are coming in. They can spot them. They, can, they know where they are. Yeah. They know what's going on. The last thing you want to do if you actually want to conserve the area is to get rid of them. That is the last thing you want to do. So what, is, what you should be doing, and this is where I'm reverting to 
old white guy may tell you, telling conservation what they should be doing, they should go there and say, we have resources. Do you want us to help you to conserve your land? If so, you tell us how. It's very easy, yeah. Of course, there are then going to be all kinds of complexities. You know, who are you listening to? What are the local forces that work? All the rest of it. But the situation at the moment is complex. It's not going to be more complex than that. And when I put this to uh, somebody who is very close to uh, senior le levels at uh, uh, places like WWF, uh, the reply was that is the last thing they will do because conservation is all about power, it's all about money, and uh, this is the last thing they will do. Well, they will do it if enough people tell them to do it. Yeah. The image, people like WWF, the image, the cuddly panda, is viewed as the imperial colonial oppressor in the places where the cuddly panda is actually working. And if people here realised that, things would change. <coughs> so my message is conservation racist, undoubtedly it's racist. It's rooted in racism, it starts in racism. And if people here want to do something about it and want it to actually work, then they have to carry that message to the conservation organisation. It's not just WWF, it's all the big ones. Uh, they're mainly in the States, the, the German, Dutch, British, American money is where the, the main money for all this is coming from. They're government funded, they're funded by the corporates. If you look on the board of directors of any of these organizations, you will find corporates, arms manufacturers, big oil, big pharma, and all the rest of it. What do you think these people are really doing? Are they really doing what you think of as conservation? No. Don't believe it. So it has to change not just because of the injustice, but because it doesn't work. Yeah, you want conservation, you have to put local people in the driving seat.